Praise the Lord, everyone. If we could all stand. On the way down to church, I was praying about what to say, because I'm telling you, it is not easy to come up here at the beginning of service and try to say something. But one thing that just kept popping in my mind was a song that Sister Missy always sings, and it was The Enemy's Camp. And I was thinking about this week and how thankful I am for Thanksgiving and getting to spend time with my family and all that. But I was thinking about those times that, you know, the devil just really wants to get on my nerves, and I'm tired of it. And he steals my he steals my thankfulness, he steals my joy, all these things. But you know what? I think of that song, and I think, you know what? He's never even near me because he's under my feet. So if we could just start this service off with praise and worship, and to remember, the devil's just always under my feet. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, let's praise our great God. Let's praise our God. Praise you, Jesus. I glorify you, Lord. I praise your name. I exalt you, God. I exalt you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it. Tell him you love him. Tell him he's a great God. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. Glorify you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your mighty name, Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Could we sing that just a few more times, Sister Missy? How great is our God. Hallelujah, Jesus. How great. Oh, thank you, God. I glorify you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Nobody knows like I know what God has done for me. Nobody knows like you know what God has done for you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As we go to prayer today, we want to lift up Brother McKimmy, but he is still in Camden Clark, but they will be moving him to, I believe, to elder care. Uh, probably at the beginning of the week, he got called in that weekend vortex that you can't do anything on the weekend. And so he should be moved to elder care for rehab uh, starting on, I believe, Monday they'll be taking him. Uh, Sister McKimmy is still at elder care going through rehab, so let's pray for both of them. Also, a lady from the church in Clarksburg, Tracy Sandy, is having brain tumor surgery. And so we want to pray for Tracy, Sister Tracy. And ask God to be with her through this. Uh, also, we want to pray for Alan, uh, Alan Barnett. Alan, Betty is, we've been praying for Betty for some time now. And I believe it was Saturday morning. Was it Saturday morning or Friday morning? Today, Sunday. Friday. Okay, Friday morning, Betty passed away, and so we want to pray for uh, Alan and that family, that God will be with them, and God would touch them. Let's pray for Kai that was here last Sunday, 
that, that God would touch him. He needs a healing physically. And let's just pray God touch him spiritually as well and minister to him. Brother Tom, we want to lift Brother Tom up and Sister Massey and Sister Walker continue to pray for her. Sister Robin's mother, Libby, let's continue to lift her up in prayer. And uh, others I see on down the prayer list today, Sister Jenny's mother, Tanya, is doing better, I understand, much better. And so let's pray for her. Uh, also, uh, Natasha Hayes is having surgery in the morning for cancer. Let's pray that God would touch her. Pray for the Tingler family, uh, unable to be here today. For Brother Darren, that's traveling. They're all traveling today. So let's ask God to be with them. A lot of names on the prayer list. I'm sure there's needs in the congregation. Just slip your hands up. Jesus knows all about it, doesn't he? He knows all about it. Let's pray for this service, that God order this service today. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God. We praise you, Lord, in your mighty name as we gather in this house. We've come, God, today with this anticipation in our spirit. God, of the moving of the power of the Holy Ghost, that, God, you minister to us today. Let your hand be upon this, God, and order this service, direct every part of it in Jesus' name, that, God, your blessing would move in this place. We pray, God, for every need, every hand that was raised. I, God, by your power, God, we have great faith in our God. And by the authority of your word and the power that's in your name, we speak the word of faith and believe you, Jesus, to minister to every need today. Pray your hand upon every need, God, by your power. I ask you, God, to minister today, Lord, in this house. And every name on the prayer list be with the McKimmies. And, God, you touch them physically in their bodies, God, with healing, virtue, and strength. And God, you administer, continue to touch Tanya and minister to her and Libby. And we pray, God, for Sister Sandy and for Alan, God, that you administer to them and all the others that's on the prayer list today, those in need of healing, but especially for the backslidden, for the away, those that away from God. Lord, I pray, God, such a conviction in their spirit, such a conviction in their heart, God, that, Lord Jesus, it would draw them back to the altar. Bring them back to a place of salvation, O oh God, that they would seek after you. We pray it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You deserve the glory and the honor as we lift, lift our, our hands. hands. Magnify your name, you deserve the glory and the honor as we lift our hands in worship to magnify.
like to be anointed and prayed for, would you come? If you'd like to be anointed and prayed for, would you come and let us anoint you today in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Why don't we lift our hands and thank God for answering prayer. Lord, you're a prayer answering God. And we praise you, Jesus. We glorify your name, Jesus. How great is our God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, we glorify you. We praise you, Jesus. You are your great. Christ. him some. I got to worship him. I got to glorify. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. He deserves the praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah, Jesus. Magnify your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Brother Jonathan, would you take these prayer requests and pray over them? In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Brother Carl. You may be seated. Ushers, would you come and worship the Lord in our giving today? What a privilege to give to the kingdom of God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God, today. I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost in this place. I feel you, Jesus. Lord, I pray today, God, as we come to this point, 
in our service, this part of our worship. God, we give unto the kingdom. We pray you multiply it. Lord, that souls be added to the kingdom, many souls, hundreds and thousands of souls be added to the kingdom of God because of the giving of this church. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. More than anything else, God, we want you. More than anything else, God, we want you. More than this world, more than money, more than fame. God, all of it pales in comparison to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. <clears throat> Stand, if you would, in honor of the word of the Lord. First Samuel chapter three. I love him, don't you? I love you. I love him. With all of my heart. I got a message the other day, a text or something from one preacher friend of mine. And he was just kind of sending this as a general text to several several of his preacher friends. And he said, he said, just remember, Pastor, it's God, family, and then your ministry. It's God, family, and then it's your ministry. But always at the top is God. Always first and foremost is God in your life. I would not trade what I have. I wouldn't trade this what, the way I live. I wouldn't trade my lifestyle for anything. I cannot think of anything that can be offered that would be worth me walking away from God for. Losing my salvation, losing eternity. What, what in the world could be worth that and I cannot imagine anything I'm so glad I know him I'm glad I know him I'm glad I'm not just a just a perimeter person you know there's some folks they just live on the perimeter they just they just want to live they want to live close enough to the world and they can do their sinning and do that stuff and and, and, and still say they come to church and they do this. I, I don't want to be a perimeter person. I want to be a center person. I want to be at the center of the will of God. I want to be the center. I, I, the farther away I can get from the world, the better off I am. The farther away I can get from, from, from uh, the temptations of this world, the better off I am. It, it's, there is nothing in the world that compares to living for God. Nothing. Nothing. Hallelujah. Sermon number one. First Samuel chapter three, verse one, the Bible says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the, Lord, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. 
And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and, that sh and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. I want to speak to you for the next few minutes. Title of this Sunday's message is the hope of again. There's hope in again. Would you pray for me? Lord, in your precious name, I pray your anointing upon me as your servant that I may minister your word today under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that God, by your mighty power, Lord, you would saturate this house. Let it not be a work of the flesh, but a work of the Spirit, a work of the anointing of God. Lord, I pray, God, against every wall that's been built. I pray right now, God, against everything that's tried to harden the heart of those that would be here today. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that under the unction of the Holy Ghost that God, hearts would be changed and stirred and moved today by the word of the Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it in the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, do it in the Holy Ghost. Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. Do it in the Holy Ghost, O oh God. In the name of Jesus. Oh my God. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, somebody praise him for a moment. Let's set the atmosphere for this word to come forth. God, I praise you right now, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Oh, my God, my God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated. The Word of God is a very unique book in that it records the history of men and women who have set on a journey to seek God. It's a book that records their desire to forsake all, to go after God. They, leave, they would leave professions, they would leave careers, they would leave family, all in a pursuit of a knowledge and a relationship with God. Everything that the Word of God records, we find Moses who would climb a mountain to hear the voice of God. We find Joshua who would stand and he would look at an impossible situation, a city that was totally unconquerable to hear God and a, and a theophany and an angel appear beside him to tell him that he would win the battle. We find over and over again through the Word of God men and women who in a desire and a hunger of their heart and their soul would set out to seek God and how God would interact with these seekers, how God would interact with people who would genuinely Genuinely, I'm not talking about somebody that I was talking about earlier that was on the periphery just sitting on the side. I'm talking about somebody that would seek after God. David in the psalm cried out early, Will I seek thee? There is a desire. There is something planted within the human, the, the, the makeup of humanity, that there is something within us that seeks after a relationship with God. Often it is filled by worldliness. Often it is filled by carnality. Often it's filled by other things. But that does not change the fact that within every single one of us there is a desire to seek after God. The Bible records men and women of God 
who set out on a journey, some of them as overcomers, some of them who struggled, some of them who dealt, who, who, were, who were dealt difficult hands in life, but still was able to, to pursue their seeking after God. There was a man, his name is Clarence McCartney. He was a preacher. He's passed on now. He pastored at the Pittsburgh Tabernacle. And he once described what he thought were the greatest words in the Bible. And he said, he said, the saddest word in the Bible is sin because of its destructive nature. The most beautiful word in the Bible is forgiveness because it is given to those who will ask for it. He said the meanest word in the Bible is gossip. He said the most dangerous word in the Bible is tomorrow. And the hardest word in the Bible is no. But I want to present to you today that in your pursuit of God, that in your seeking after God, there is another word in the Bible that is just as great. Jeremiah said in tw chapter 24 and verse 4, he said, again, the word of the Lord came unto me. I want to present to you today that a word that offers hope to to many today is the word again. The word that offers hope is to many today is that God is not just a one-time God. God is not just a one opportunity God. God is not just a God that gives you a shot in the dark but doesn't come back. But God is a God that stands at the door and knocks again and again and again and again. A few years ago, Martha Stewart was sentenced. Anybody know Martha Stewart? She was sentenced to jail. She did her time right here in West Virginia. But before she left to fulfill her sentence, she made this statement in regard to her fans in her audience. She said, I'll be back. I'll be back. And a few years after that, we see Martha Stewart again back on television we see her again at the and in the headlines and in magazine covers and and all this kind of thing is back. I I don't know I don't know if it's just me, but we admire people who make statements when they get knocked down, when they get knocked out, when they when they get pushed aside, that they make a statement with tenacity and force and faith, and they say I'll be back. There there's something in that about us. We admire people like that. We admire admire people that say, you know what, I'm not a quitter. I'm not a quitter. I'll be back. I don't give up. I'll be back. I don't walk away from it. I'll be back. I'm not glorifying what she did, but neither am I making statement that we all have to fall to a sin. But I'm saying that humanity makes mistakes. People make mistakes. People make choices that aren't good choices. They make mistakes. Tell Adam and Eve, uh, it's all their fault. We'll just blame Adam and Eve if you got to blame somebody. But we know that people come short. The Bible tells us that we all fall short of the glory of God. People come up short. But it's the one that refuses to stay down that wins. It's the one that refuses to give up uh, that goes on to victory. It's the one that won't stay down on the track uh, that makes it across the finish line. i got to tell somebody, it's time to get up again. It's time to get Get up again. It's time to get up again. It's the one that finds help in God that makes the difference. It's the one that finds help in God that makes the difference. How many times have we stood in the presence of God and said, here I am again, Lord. God, I need you again. I've got to feel you again. God, I need your touch one more time. There was a song many years ago, Lord, you know I need a brand new touch. Oh, there's something about people. People that come back and say, I won't quit when it gets rough. I won't quit when I mess up. I won't quit. <coughs> I won't quit when I make a mistake. I'm coming back again. I'm coming back again. Again is the word that offers us hope. 
Sin is used in the Word of God 448 times. Anger is used 234 times. Hate, 87 times. Bitterness, 22 times. Envy, 20 times. Lust, 18 times. But please understand that I'm not minimizing any of those. I'm not minimizing any of those. All of those things are destructive in their nature. All of those things are destructive in their nature. But the Word again appears in the Word of God 672 times. It is spread out from the beginning of the Word of God. And that tells me that God's abundance, that tells me that God's abundance can defeat feet sin and hate and anger and bitterness and envy and lust that God can again do it again six times in the word of God the Bible says the word of the Lord came again nine times again the word of the Lord came to me that may not mean a lot to you that may not mean a lot to you but to a little boy left by his mother and left in the hands of the priest, left there because she had promised God, if you'll give me a son, I'll bring him to you. I'll present him back to you. It not, again may not mean a whole lot to you in that point in time, but here's a young boy. Here's a young boy, and the word again makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference to him. It makes all the difference to his destiny and to his future. You think of the power of what happened to Samuel. Samuel, during a time of spiritual darkness, it was a time Eli was the priest, but he wasn't much of a priest. He wasn't leading the people spiritually. Eli himself was backslid. Eli and his sons, his sons were even worse than he was. It was a spiritually dark time. The word of God was rare, the Bible says, in Israel during that time. The fire of God was not burning in the temple. It wasn't burning in the church. And Eli the priest had retired pretty much from his duties, not just literally, but figuratively. And he was not leading the people spiritually. The Bible says that Eli's eyes were dim. He was without vision. But in that spiritual obscurity, in that spiritual darkness of that day, there was a young man who had been dedicated by his mother. If I have dedicated your children in this church, more than likely I've talked about Samuel. If I have presented your children to the Lord and dedicated them to God, and folks, if you've dedicated your children, children to God. You've got a responsibility to bring up your children in the fear of God. And if I, she presented her son to the priest, she brought him to the priest and said, I dedicate this, this young child. I want you to take him. I want you to raise him in the temple. I want you to teach him the things of God. I want you to direct him in the path of God. And this young man was left there during a spiritual darkness. Eli lying down in his bed. Samuel lying down in his bed. And out of nowhere comes a voice, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel didn't recognize the voice. He didn't recognize what he heard. And he said, here am I. And he gets up and he goes to Eli and he said, I'm, I'm here. What do you need? And Eli says, I didn't say anything, Samuel. Go back to bed, son. Go back to sleep. I'm tired. Go back to sleep. Samuel's laying there again in the darkness of his room. He hears it again, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel gets up and he goes again to Eli and he says, I'm here. What do you need? Eli says, I didn't say anything. Go lay down, Samuel. Go back to bed. Samuel lays in that dark room again and he lays there. And he, I, I don't know if he was listening to see if he heard anything or if he was trying to go to sleep, but there it came again, Samuel, Samuel. And the third time, Samuel, the Bible says he didn't know the Lord at that time, and he didn't recognize the voice of God. Mom and Dad, you need to raise your kids to recognize the voice of God. You need to raise your children to recognize when God speaks in their life. You need to raise your children so they don't miss the voice of God. God. Samuel gets up the third time and he goes to Eli. And this time Eli, Eli's sharp enough. He's astute enough to 
recognize what's going on. And he said, if it happens again, Samuel, if the Lord speaks to you one more time, if that voice comes again, you say, Lord, here am I. He, un he understood that it was God calling this young man. He understood that God was speaking to him. Not once, not twice, but three times God had tried to get the attention of this young man. And again, he had sent him back to bed each time. And the Lord come the fourth time. The Lord come again and called as he did at other times. And he said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered him, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Think of the authority of the word of God. Think of the authority of this scripture. God spoke to this young man not one time, not two times, not three times, but God came four times to speak and get the attention of this young man. Maybe there's somebody in this house today that God has been trying to get your attention. Maybe there's somebody that God's been trying to speak to you. And maybe this is the fourth time and God is saying your name and he's calling your name. Four times. God didn't just speak once and leave. God didn't speak twice and turn his back on Samuel. God didn't speak three times and turn his back on Samuel. But God kept coming back. He kept knocking at the door. Behold, someone standeth at the door and knocks. And he's waiting for somebody that will open the door to him. Oh, he's waiting for somebody that will respond. Perhaps you... <laughs> <coughs> maybe you've been praying for somebody maybe you've been praying and fasting for somebody for them to hear the voice of God trust me God speaks again trust me God speaks again we don't always hear the first time we don't always hear the first time we don't always pay attention the second time. We don't always understand the third time. But I'm here today telling somebody, speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. I love it. <coughs> Excuse me. I love it in the word of God when God does things like that. I like it. I like to read about creation. Brother Jonathan, God said, let there be light. And there it was. There was light. There was no light, and then there's light. There was darkness. I mean, what's it like to be in a place, and I don't even think there was a place, but to be, and, and there not be, exists light. But God spoke, and light existed. And then God spoke, and the firmament, in the midst of the waters, and the waters begin to divide, and all of a sudden there's dry land just like that because God spoke, and it happened. Just in the moment, God spoke and let the waters be gathered together in one place, and the dry land appear in the other, and it was so God spoke. Over and over again in the Word of God, we see miraculous things just at the moment, just at the speaking of the Word of God. God does it with things God speaks one time, but with you and me, God doesn't just speak one time. Because God's mercy, God's mercy goes beyond a one-time altar call. God's mercy goes beyond a one-time opportunity. God's mercy, oh, if God was just a one-time opportunity, there'd be so many of us, we wouldn't even be here today. If God just gave us a one-time opportunity, a little 12-year-old boy knelt in a little church at an altar, wooden altar, on wood floors, and they had, they had pads out, they'd put corduroy corduroy over the pads for the altars didn't make a difference it was just as hard with or without got down and prayed 12 years old and at that altar god filled that little 12 year old boy with the holy ghost oh what an opportunity what a what an opportunity for that young man what an opportunity for God to shape that life. What an opportunity for God to take that one life and to, and to use that, that young man all of his life. And that young man goes off and goes astray because he starts co connecting with the wrong people and the wrong crowd. And this happens and that happens. And he ends up way away from God, backslidden. Backslidden and away from God. What a terrible place to be. It's terrible to be backslidden. I know I've been there. Backslidden situation is a terrible place to be. 
because you know what you need to do. You wake up knowing what you need to do. You go through the day knowing what you need to do, but you're not doing it. You're doing something else, and you know what you're doing is going to take you to hell. You know what you're doing. You're going to be lost. You know what you're doing, but, but you're backslidden, and you're away from God. And if God was just an one opportunity, God, this preacher wouldn't be here today because I was that 12-year-old boy and I prayed through the Holy Ghost at 12, but I messed up and I failed along the way and I got mixed up and messed up and, and, and all kinds of up, but mostly down. But God, God reminded me one Sunday night that failure is not fatal. I had failed God, but it wasn't fatal. I had walked away from God, but it wasn't fatal. I had went back out into the world, and I would got caught up into all kinds of ungodliness and sin, but it wasn't fatal because God is not just the God of one time. He's the God of again. Samuel, Samuel. Oh, oh, here I'll come again, Samuel. I'll speak again, Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. We all know the story of the reluctant prophet opens up in Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, and saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. And two chapters later, and if you want to fill in those two chapters, you'll know that Jonah ran from God. He got on a boat and he ran from God, literally trying to get as far away from God as possible. I don't know how you do that. I, I don't think anybody here could explain how you get away from God because wherever you go, God is there. You can't get away from God. You can't escape God. You're never out of the sight of God. And Jonah, trying to get away from God, got on a ship and he headed, headed away from God. And, and the Bible says that God sent strong wind and storm. And that ship started rocking and they started bailing to the point they were throwing stuff over, over the ship to try to save themselves because the storm was tearing the ship apart. And down in the bottom of the ship was Jonah asleep in the middle of the storm. That's even worse. Being, being in what God sent to shake you up and you're trying to sleep through it, oh, my friend, you better be careful. You're in a danger dangerous place but Jonah they went and woke him up and Jonah told him this is all because of me this this is going on in your life because of me I have brought the storm into your home I brought the storm into your family I brought the storm into your situation and the Bible says that they took Jonah threw Jonah overboard on the ship and God sent a great fish a whale that swallowed him up picture that and for three days, Jonah sat in the belly of that well till he finally came to a place of repentance. And the Bible says two chapters later, chapter 3 and verse 1 of the book of Jonah, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Oh, had Jonah obeyed in chapter 1, chapter 3 would not have been necessary. There would have been no storm. And there would have been, Jonah would not have had to confess to running away from God. But now Jonah found himself in that well and God came to him the second time. No well, no need to repent. God came to him the second time. And Jonah went through Nineveh and he preached. And revival happened in a Gentile city because one man finally obeyed God. Because God came again because God didn't just say Jonah I'm done with you I'll throw you off to the side I'll just put you on the heap and forget about you know God said I'm coming to Jonah again 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 the fact is God knows us God knows you God knows you he knows you're down sitting and he knows you're uprising David wrote, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou, <coughs> thou compasseth my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. He said, before you say what you say, I know what you're going to say. 
thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. And whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. But he's the God of again. He knows you. He knows your strength. He knows you. <coughs> he knows your weakness. He saw Gideon when Gideon was uncertain and fearful. When Gideon didn't think he could be what God called him to be. God called him a warrior. And he heard Gideon's prayers. And Gideon, he said, God, I need to hear from you again. I need to hear from you again. God, Gideon put out a fleece. And he said, make the fleece wet and the, dry, and the ground dry. And God heard and answered. And Gideon said, wait a minute. God, I need to hear from you again. Make the fleece dry and the ground wet, and I'll know I've heard from God. And God came again and answered him. I'm telling you, if you need an answer, if you've been flooded and overwhelmed with stuff in your life, if you've been flooded and overwhelmed and you've tried to try to get your way out and dig your way out and swim your way to the top in the middle of the storm that you're in, God is the God of again. That's why Noah sent out the dove again because God is the God of again. Isaac dug wells, the wells of his father. He dug them again. And by Isaac's actions, he was saying, I'm back home where I belong. I'm back where I belong. If you're disconnected from where you need to be with God, you can dig the wells again. If you're disconnected and you've lost that fervor in your spirit for God, you can dig the wells again. If you're disconnected in your relationship with God, and I'm not talking about being backslid, I'm just talking about somebody that's kind of straight off to the side a little bit, and you've lost your vision, and you've lost your drive, and you've lost your passion for God, I'm telling you, you can dig your wells again, and you can get back to where you need to be with God, because God is the God of again. I don't think I could preach this, story, this sermon without referring to a New Testament example of a young man that was brought up having everything. He had everything he could have ever wanted. He had everything his heart desires. He was brought up in the father's house. The father provided everything for him. The father gave him food on the table every day. The father made sure he had clothes on his back every day. The father made sure he had a room to sleep in every night and a bed to lay his head down. The father made sure there was provision for his son. He made sure that everything was taken care of. But somewhere along the line, his son started looking down that long road and started thinking, I wonder what's at the end of the road. I wonder what's outside of the Father's house. I wonder what's, what's out there for me. I wonder what I could get out there and what could be done for me out there. I wonder if I'd be happier out there than I am in the house, my Father's house. And he went to his father one day, and he said, Dad, give me, give me my inheritance. I, I'm, I appreciate everything you've done for me, but it's time for me to go. I, I just give me what belongs to me. I don't want anything else. Just give me what belongs to me. I'll leave. I'll get out of your way, and I'll go, and I'll make my own way. I'll do my own thing. I want to see what's out there. I want to see what's beyond your house. I want to see what's beyond what you do. Dad, every day I have to work your field. Every day, like, like every good father, he, he made sure his sons invested in the household. He made sure his, his children invested in, in they had the responsibilities that they had to do every day in the house. And he made sure that was done. Somewhere along the line, the, the, the father's house got a little too rigid. 
and the father's house got a little too restrictive and the father's house got a little little more than what he wanted and he thought oh there's freedom down the road away from my father's house and the father gave him what he wanted and he walked away and he headed down the road away from the father's house but he soon found out that not everything down the road was great oh it was for a while because sin has pleasure for a season sin has pleasure but sin has a clock on it and there comes a time that sin the pleasure of sin will end the pleasure of sin is over all of a sudden you realize that it's not what it's meant to be it's not what the billboard says it is it's not what the sitcom makes it look like it's not what what's on television it's not like that at all because sin is sin and sin comes with a cost and it always demands payment sin becomes the taskmaster and you become the slave sin becomes the debtor and you are the one that has to pay and this young man partied for a while but soon found himself found himself slopping hogs walking around in pig dung cleaning up the mess of pigs and this young man the Bible says he came to himself that tells me that anything outside of what he was getting ready to do was just craziness he came to himself and he said the servants eat better at the father's house than I do the servants eat better at the father's house more than I do and so the son in those rags of clothes that he had in those rags of clothes that he wore his son pulled himself up out of that big bin, leaving a trail of mud in his path, headed back to the father's house, hoping that he could find a little mercy, hoping he could find a little mercy. And he makes his way back there, and he walks up, and standing out on the porch, and I believe he did it every day, I believe this is exactly what he did every day. He would, the father would walk out on the porch and he would look down that road and he would cover his eyes so he could see as far as he could. Maybe, maybe today, maybe today my son's coming home. Maybe today I'll see him walking down the road. Maybe today he'll make his way back. And time and again he had turned around and walked back in the house. But today he walked out and he put his hands to his eyes one more time. And he looked down, and there came his son. And he was making his way in muddy clothes and all, with the stench of pig all over him. And the father jumped off that porch, ran down that, ran down that road, wrapped his arms around that boy, because if he had left him to his own, the law said the boy should be stoned because he had rebelled against his father. But the father, in an act of mercy, and the father, in an act of love, he welcomed his son home again. He welcomed his son back again. He redeemed his son because he had come back to the father's house. Jesus, in the scriptures, made reference over and over again that he would rise again. He would rise again. The God who has come knocking again at your door is here today. The God who again, put Micah chapter 7 and verse 8 up. Pastor, I have failed God so miserably. I have failed God so miserably. 
I don't think God would want me back. Pastor, I know what you've preached. And I've done everything that you preach against. And I've done it. I don't think God would want me back. But I'm talking about the same God who welcomed Peter, who failed God three times in a row. Micah said, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Can God do it again? Ask Jeremiah, the prophet, who went to the potter's house and heard the voice of the potter say, Cannot I do with you as with this? Cannot not I make you again? There's hope in again. Because God is still knocking. God is still knocking. He's the creator and he's the recreator. And there is not, there is not. Failure is not fatal. You may have failed God, but God's here again. God's ready again. Just like God took that 29-year-old man who walked away from God as a teenager. And God said, I'm here again. And God filled him with the Holy Ghost all over again. Oh, pastor, I'm not backslid, but I just need a brand new touch. Oh, pastor, I'm not a, I haven't lost out with God, but I just need God to touch me again. I just need God to refresh me again. I just need God to move in my life again. Oh, I'm telling you, there's a God of again that's in this house. I need God to restore my faith again. I need God to restore my faith again. I need, <coughs> I need God to give me my joy again. I need God to give me my peace again. I need God to move again. I need to feel him again. I need God to touch me again. Oh, that's it. Let's turn this church into an altar right now. Oh, let's cry out, God, I need you again. Oh, seek after him. I need you again. This altar's open. If you want to come and pray at this altar and you want somebody to pray with you, this altar's open. Could we stand today? Could we stand? This altar's open. I need your touch. I need to be prayed for, preacher. I need God to touch me again. Oh, God. I'm telling you, it can happen again. God will do it again. God will wrap his arms around you. He'll show mercy to you. He'll receive you. There's a father standing on the porch, looking down the road, waiting for you again. Oh, God. Oh, right now, where you're at right now, reach out to God. There's hope in again. He's calling your name again. He's calling your name again. I seem to be. Oh God, I need a touch right now. This altar's open. 
This altar's open. He's oh, God. Me.